Hello and welcome to today's webinar, OCRT eLearning Series, Part 3, Unpacking Organic Cotton Pricing. Today's presentation will be recorded and sent out to all registered participants and also will be posted on the Hub. We will have a Q&A portion throughout the presentation. You can type your questions into the question box on the webinar doc. Now on to Sarah with Textile Exchange. Sarah? Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us. We have got um, over 300 people signed up to this webinar, which is great. And I can see that many of you are starting to join. So just whilst we wait for more people to arrive, uh, feel free to ask uh, to answer the poll that we've got on the screen. Why does organic cotton cost more? And to answer it, you can go to menti.com and use the code 99988377 to add your answer in there. So um, the current supply shortage is, by, is the most popular answer at the moment. I think we'll probably see that graph change as more people come online. And then in a moment, I'm just gonna run through a little bit of housekeeping before we get started with today's session and before I introduce you to our excellent panel of speakers. So we'll just give it a minute until we uh, tip over the 100 mark and then we'll get going. So please, for those of you who've just joined, go to menti.com and use the code on the screen to uh, add your views on why organic costs more. Okay, so all of the above is now starting to tick over as the favorite answer. And uh, I think some of you may well have read the pre-read that was uh, attached to the, um, the, the invite. So that's excellent. Okay, well, that mean Menti will be open for a bit longer, but um, can we click through to the next slide, please? And one more, please, thank you. Um, okay, can, I'm not sure that slide is showing up so well on everyone's screen. It's not particularly on mine, but that might just be me. If one of the other team can um, address it, if not. So first of all, this is who I am, Sarah Compson. I'm organic cotton specialist with Textile Exchange and I'll be your host for today for the next hour. Next slide, please. So in terms of um, Zoom, just some, classic Zoom housekeeping. Um, please update your Zoom name to include your full name and your organization in brackets. Um, we'd love it if you could introduce yourself in the chat box because we do have so many people joining today from all over the world and we'd love to hear where you're, um, you're dialing in from. And if you have any questions for our panelists, please put them in the Q&A. Um, please put them in the Q&A box because that is where we'll be able to um, see what all the questions are and to prioritize those and also to harvest all those questions in the likely event that we're not going to be able to get through all of them today. And also finally, please note that the meeting is being recorded. Now, I think we may not have a chat box today, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Okay, next slide, please. So this is our antitrust statement. Textile exchange convenes the textile community and values diversity of views, expertise, opinions, backgrounds, and experiences. It's expected that members of this community will collaborate by sharing ideas, information, and resources of publicly available information only and avoid discussions on price, strategic plans, or other private and sensitive information. Now, you might be wondering if, if we've got mentioned price in the antitrust statement, how are we going to be tackling this question today? Well, of course, we're not going to be talking about specific prices of cotton. We're going to be talking more generally about the topic. Next slide, please. Oh, and also, um, I don't know if we've got Irma online. Are you, are you online, Irma? Are you able to um, let our Turkish friends know that there is Turkish translation available. So if you um, wish to listen to this webinar in Turkish, you need to go down to the interpretation tab at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Or oh, might be at the top, it depends on your computer, um, but look for interpretation and select that to get the Turkish interpretation. Okay, so 
the aims of today's session then, we really want to try and do three things today. First, to provide you all with a better understanding of what factors influence the price of organic cotton. We want to try and inspire you through some real life examples, which are going to be presented by our wonderful panelists, who I'm going to hand you over to in a minute. And we want to equip you with practical information that you can take into your own situation, whatever that may be. So as I mentioned, we prepared a pre-read for this webinar and that explores the factors that affect organic cotton pricing. And um, we're going to share that. I guess we have to share that in the Q&A box because we don't have a chat function. So if one of the team could share that. Now, this is a work in progress, this paper, and we'd like to use today's webinar um, and your questions and your comments and what we hear from the panelists to further develop this paper. We all know that demand for organic cotton is at an all time high. And in the long term, this is a good thing um, for people and the planet. If we're to avert catastrophic climate change and biodiversity collapse and to have fair and equitable relationships in supply chains, we are going to need to see large scale shifts in the way that agricultural land is managed. Now, organic offers a tried and tested blueprint for how this can be done. And by capitalizing on the demand for organic in the right way, we can directly move agriculture in the right direction. But we know that challenges exist that could stop this high demand being translated into tangible action. And price volatility is one of them. Now the Organic Cotton Roundtable is here to help address barriers and successfully scale the adoption of organic by providing a space to work collectively and collaboratively with the worldwide organic cotton community. And everyone here today, all of you, has an important role to play. Now we carried out a survey earlier in the year to better understand the demand for organic cotton and the perceived barriers for scaling organic. And um, I'll ask one of the team to put that um, to make that available through a link in either the chat or the q and I'm not sure which one's open right now. Um, now, price was given, unsurprisingly, as a key barrier. And we didn't really need a survey to tell us that. We're hearing it from all of you every day. So we really scheduled this webinar to bring the community together to have a conversation about how we can handle this issue. And the pre-read I mentioned earlier outlined some of the factors affecting organic cotton pricing. And I won't go into the detail of that because you can read it after the webinar if you haven't already, but really the key points to note within that are that there are many good reasons to justify the price differential between organic and conventional cotton. Organic cotton internalizes many of the costs that would otherwise be paid for by society and the environment. We're gonna need business models that recognize and reward the true value of organic cotton if we're to achieve the shifts in agriculture that we know we need to see. And whilst our current economic paradigm is more of a hindrance than a help, there are ways to ensure that fair prices uh, throughout the uh, value chain can be achieved. And um, our panelists are gonna be covering that in a bit more detail. And the paper lists some very broad suggestions, but today our panelists will go into how they have tackled the issues head on, and they will no doubt have very valuable insights that we can all learn something from. So that's enough from me. I'm going to go into introducing our speakers. Next slide, please. So we are, these are our four speakers and um, I will introduce them by turn. So we're first of all going to hear from Aaron Ambatapuri, who's director of the Chetna Coalition, which is a sustainable value chain community working to support Chetna organic cotton farmers through a collaborative sourcing model. So Aaron, over to you. We'd love to have your take on this topic. Uh, Sarah, thank you for having me in. Uh, uh, so uh, can I just uh, switch off my video because uh, because of the internet issues here? Is that okay? Yes, that's fine, Aaron. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so uh, let me introduce uh, uh, briefly about uh, Chetna Coalition. Chetko, as we call it in short, uh, was actually facilitated by Textile Exchange at their, at their annual conference in 2013 in Istanbul, Turkey, at the same time as OKA, Organic Cotton Accelerator. Uh, as you uh, briefly suggested, it's a supply chain uh, you know, initiative, a coalition of brands, small and medium brands, who have come together, uh, you know, uh, part of a membership-based initiative to support farmers 
and ensure that there is a traceability to the whole uh, you know pricing open costing sheets then you know and there is a a, a kind of a, a transparency around the, uh, purchasing procurement and supporting farmers so uh, at chetco we go by the simple principle of working directly with farmers and making them viable as equal stakeholders in the organic cotton supply chain system and treat them as co-owners because the problem with uh, you know mostly organic cotton also has become more like uh, you know it's been commodified uh, over the years so unfortunately they have become more recipients and not you know equal stakeholders so for us it's important that they are part of the supply chain where they have equal rights and they are in a position to negotiate uh, and and uh, and and for us it's also important that uh, the, we also feel that uh, you know uh, when you raise the issues about pricing and which is very good that you know when you say that uh, it's an it's a, at a halt all time high uh, very nice but uh, our question is about whether uh, what is being now treated as a higher price on the on the fiber or the lid how does that translate into payment for farmers as we see now when you have a 60 to 70% increase in the organic cotton lint fiber price because of various factors as you highlighted in your document uh, the the pre read document uh, how much of this is it actually going to farmers uh, in a general sense so yeah i don't think uh, really farmers are any uh, earning anything it's just you know the lint prices are going up have gone up Uh, but uh, farmers are they earning enough are they being paid enough is there enough traceability to see that farmers are being paid uh, that is the big question that i have as a farmer you know as a person you know working for farmers okay thank you everyone i'm not sure if you've um, stopped or we've lost your connection Uh, no, I stopped. Great. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that. We will certainly be coming back to you with some questions later. Um, so now I am going to hand over to Max Daybell, who's president, a vice president of purchases and sales at Otto Stadlander, um, who are century old cotton traders who've been working with organic cotton for the last decade. So, over to you, Max. Hi, Sarah, and uh, thanks for inviting me today to this uh, webinar. Um, as Sarah already mentioned, I'm working for the Stadlander. We are a hundred-year-old cotton trading house based in Bremen. Um, Bremen has a very long history um, in the cotton trade, um, but nowadays I'm probably one of the few panelists here sitting the furthest away from a cotton field. Um, a couple of years ago, we've decided that sustainable cotton, and in particular organic cotton, is something which which we need to promote and which we need to engage uh, in a stronger way. Um, this this absolute shift of Uh, of sourcing structure and and sustainability is something we've we've foreseen and we've adapted uh, quite early to, um, and uh, nowadays sustainable cotton, whether organic or BCI or uh, fair trade, is a large large share of our portfolio of um, origins and cottons we offer. Um, so um, yeah, today's session about the pricing, um, I am I won't be able to give you the view of a farmer, um, but. Given our share in the organic market and um, being able to overlook um, a good a good share of the trade of organic cotton, um, I can I can give you my perspective from a merchant point of view, um, and that is basically that um, the farmers and this is something Arun has already pointed out. Um, depending on how they've sold the cotton onward, we're mostly not able to participate uh, or are not able to participate to the largest extent of the current price development. Um, but quite contrary, uh, stakeholders amongst the supply chain, starting from ginners, um, going to spinning mills, are the ones um, that are basically um, not causing this price increase, but are there to um, are participating in that to a certain extent. And that's mostly because the supply chain was absolutely not adapted. Um, my number one point as to pricing of organic cotton is definitely the yield loss. That's something that should be factored in. Um, the, the yield of organic cotton is not particularly lower, but lower. Um, and there's a risk involved, um, a risk to, to the farmer. And uh, that's something uh, that he cannot, he cannot hedge himself against like US uh, conventional cotton farmers. Um, so they are fully dependent on, on commitment from the supply chain. And uh, this is something that I'm here to promote 
today and, and also encourage um, the viewers and the learners um, to also consider this approach. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Max. I, I'm laughing a bit because um, I just, before we joined, I um, was very strict with all the panelists and said that I will cut them off if they go over seven minutes. And so far, both our panelists have um, kept well within the time. So thank you both. So now I'm going to hand over or invite Orlando um, Rivera, who's CEO of Birdman Rivera. And um, they were founded in 2007. And Orlando is building on his father's legacy of promoting organic cotton in Peru. And as he'll no doubt tell you, he works directly with Peruvian organic farmers, offering them a better and diverse opportunity, such as finding markets for rotation crops, improving yields, and creating transparent supply chains with international partners. Now, um, the company is fully vers vertically integrated and was the first company in Latin America to be fully GOT certified. And as a direct result of Bergman Rivera's approach, Peru is by far the largest organic cotton producer in Latin America. So over to you, Orlando. Thank you, Sarah, and good morning to everyone. Thanks for the invitation and for being part of this panel. Uh, well, to give you a little briefing about our company, we started as one of the pioneers in organic cotton by back in the 1980s, 86 to 89. Uh, our founder, Stefan Bergman, came to Peru seeking for more sustainable ways of doing textiles and started an organic cotton project called the White Cotton Project. And that's the base of our company. Uh, we work directly with farmers in different valleys around Peru. We work with different qualities of cotton. We produce a long staple cotton, extra long, staple cotton known as Pima cotton and colored cotton in the Amazon rainforest. We work with the farmers directly. We process that cotton into yarn, fabrics, and finally we produce garments directly with many international brands. Uh, the idea of our project is to have the link between the brands and the farms directly. So avoid intermediaries and make them be part of the farming project and see that their additional cost is going somewhere and it's changing the lives of the farmers. Um, we are a catalyzer between them. Our objective is to empower the farmers within our project to be able to reach a better life. In our case in Peru, uh, cotton is not, and in many parts of the world, is not a very profitable product, but it's what farmers end up doing because they either don't have the cash to go to a fruit or a tree or something more profitable, or uh, simply there's no availability for other crops in the region. So within our project, what we are trying to do is we are empowering these farmers to choose organic cotton as a stepping stone to a more profitable product. So in our project, at the end, we have farmers for around six to seven years in organic cotton. And then we are seeing gratefully and successfully that they are leaving our project to go to other products which are still organic, but are more profitable internationally. Thanks. Great, thank you, Orlando. It's a really great to um, get some background to uh, how it all works for you. So now over to Francois uh, Morion, who's co-founder of Veja, um, an ethical sneaker brand who've been purchasing organic cotton directly from producers in Brazil since their inception in 2004, and also from Bergman Rivera in Peru. And Francois, just an anecdote to tell you that last week, Textile Exchange had our um, European team meeting in London, and it was a little bit like a, a, um, a Vager shop. We looked around the table, it was just a whole load of Vager sneakers, so I thought you'd be pleased to see that. I should have taken a picture. I'm very happy to hear that. <laughs> It's like a Peja Patagonia uniform for <laughs> sustainability, pretty much. 
um, both clients of Bergman. And yes, I was very happy to, to hear uh, um, Orlando, and I think we have a pretty similar approach um, to what they are doing in Peru. Uh, but for us, it's a bit more uh, uh, awkward, we would say, because uh, we are a, a, a fashion brand, a shoe brand. And um, um, the thing is that we started um, the shoe brand because we met with uh, some rubber and cotton uh, producers. And we were so impressed by the quality, uh, the social and ecological quality of their projects that uh, we said, okay, let's, let's turn these amazing projects into a, a shoe, into a product. So um, our story is very linked to the cotton uh, farmers. And as far as price is concerned, maybe we have a, a kind of a different approach. Uh, I mean, we have never compared the price of organic cotton to the price of uh, uh, conventional cotton. So that's something that does not exist for us because we use only uh, organic cotton. So just so that people have an idea of um, how much we buy and, and for, from that's why I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to interrupt you your time isn't up but we're having some problems with your sound um it's there's quite a bit of feedback is there anything you can do to change it, it might need some headphones sorry sorry to interrupt your flow yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just that I don't think I have I don't have my headphones here oh it's actually oh. a little bit better right now is it better? I'm going to stay closer to my computer. Yeah, okay, that's good. <laughs> Sorry, carry on. Um, so, yes, we are buying uh, uh, cotton from uh, today from 14 different uh, cooperatives. Um, so, uh, um, if you, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, uh, it gives complexity. Uh, so it's 14 different contracts, um, but we managed to have only one price. Uh, uh, so it's a collective negotiation. We are really into, since the beginning, we are into the fair trade um, uh, principles. So each year we sit together with the, the, the cotton farmers. Uh, usually there are also the, the NGOs that are involved uh, um, in, the, in the conversation. And we start the conversation, like how is the price uh, um, for the farmers? Is it worth producing for that price? And usually you can really sense if the price is not good enough, people will not produce uh, uh, as well as they used to, or they will not maybe give uh, care uh, uh, sufficiently about the cotton. So, uh, um, so usually it comes in the conversation. And of course we have this conversation and we have also a look at the inflation rate. Um, I mean, these last, uh, these last years, um, we've seen uh, inflation coming back, especially, uh, I mean, we are talking about Brazil that has inflation almost for five years now. Um, so this is an issue for the farmers because they have seen their cost of living uh, uh, decreasing because of that. So um, the people that we are talking to, they're usually elected, like in the cooperatives or in the associations. So they represent the whole, uh, uh, the, 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 the families. And the people we have in the company, we have two people that go every day visiting the farmers. So they hear the stories. It's not only looking at, at inflation numbers, it's looking at these numbers, but hearing and, and sharing the daily lives of these people. And you know, when, when they tell you that the, the oil, like a liter of oil that they buy for cooking uh, has doubled in the last year, um, they show it to you and, and, and then you have a discussion about the price of what they're selling. Uh, and in this case, cotton. So um, based on all this, uh, uh, we have a, a conversation about the increase. And also that one thing that is taken is to account, into account is uh, how Veja is doing. And um, if we are able to, uh, to let's say, to uh, adapt our prices, our price structure to the increase. Um, and so if, if we have a look at these 10 last years, I did the exercise preparing the, 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 the conversation and our price has doubled. Um, and if we compare it to inflation, it got, uh, it is 15% uh, higher than the, the inflation uh, in Brazil. And I think it's because when you look at an inflation rate, you look at the whole population, but when you look at cotton farmers uh, that are uh, um, people that live 
uh, in the countryside and they don't uh, in their in their product baskets or in their in their consumption baskets they don't have a lot of services they have a lot of products and a lot of necessity products that tend to have a higher increase so actually the real inflation that they are suffering is most of the times is higher than the inflation that you can read in the papers so this is something that we also started to dig uh, uh, this year and for example uh, this year the, the 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 real inflation in brazil is was six percent um and uh, we uh, we agreed on uh, an increase of the cost the price of nine percent because the the real cost of living for the farmers has increased uh, as far as nine percent so that was really, that's really how we work like collectively and and uh, down to earth we have like uh, real conversations about that, and uh, and then we try to to, to adapt to that thing, and um, and then we have a look at all the different items where cotton is in our product because it's it's not only the canvas, it's also the lining, the laces, the the uh, the, the lining of the insoles, so many products. So then the price uh, uh, reflects in different in different ways. So that's. I would say that the, the answer to that to how we are dealing with price on a day-to-day -day basis and then to answer more like the, the third question about um, how to to look at price in a general way for for organic cotton and to be able to pay the right price i think it's, it's and i will tell something i will repeat something that orlando said uh, in milan at the textile exchange uh, summit uh, it had, we need to stop looking at cotton as a commodity. Um, and as long as you don't look at it as a commodity, um, it's a bit what is in your uh, preparatory report between price and value. When you start to look at some, uh, it's like, like um, I, like it, I like to compare it with the wine market. You know, when you buy a bottle of wine, you just don't buy a, a commodity. It's not only the name of the grape, it's also you buy a little bit of the story of the people who have produced it. And the case of cotton is the same. Uh, uh, when, you, when we go to Paraíba, let's say, a state uh, in, this, in northern Brazil, and we go to buy the cotton, we, it's not only that we buy the cotton, we interact with the culture of that particular place. We, we, in a way, we take something from this land uh, and then we incorporate it into our products. And I think this is the value. This is not only the price of that output, that the, the cotton fiber. It's also the whole story that we are able to tell our consumers. Uh, it's just like a, a wine producers, a wine label will tell to the consumer that it's a burgundy wine or anything. And, and, and it's something that has been, uh, the, the land has been worked for that purpose. And I think this is something that is, uh, uh, almost artistic and not only uh, production in terms of, of uh, like a commodity. So, yeah, uh, I think this is the, 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 your, your, um, your take, the, the, the textile exchange take on value versus price, I think is very smart because it is something that, um, that once you look at the product as, uh, as something valuable for, and I'm talking about brand and, and the story you're, talk, you're telling to your consumer, then you know th this difference of, of uh, fifty cents or one uh, one dollar uh, uh, difference. Uh, you, you started looking at it in a different uh, uh, perspective. So yeah, thank you for having me, and um, I'm happy to answer any question that will follow. Probably. Thank you, Francois. And yeah, I think that's a, a really nice way to think about it. Cotton is not a commodity. You know, this famous commodity crop. We need to start thinking about it in a completely different way. So um, a great point well made. So I'm actually just going to go back to Arun um, and uh, if I may, Arun, and um, ask you to pick up on the point that Francois just made and ask for you a little bit more of your perspective on what changes you need, you think we need to see in the industry as a whole to ensure fair prices and a rapid upscaling of organic cotton? Easy question. <laughs> We'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah. So I, I think I echo the sentiments of, uh, you know, uh, Max, uh, Orlando, and also Francois on, on uh, some of the issues that I've raised, and I don't need to repeat uh, uh, many of those things. But uh, 
in a country like india uh, it's very difficult for us to to look at uh, differential pricing so what farmers in india cotton farmers which is almost you know 4 million farmers or 5 million farmer families are involved in cotton uh, close to 20 million you know uh, members engaged in cotton cultivation they only understand the minimum support price uh, which is declared by the government of india for different commodities in agriculture it could be cotton millets a lentils it could be for coffee soy whatever so uh, this is like a this is like a benchmark that we should focus on currently what's been happening in india with organic cotton is that uh, while there is a, a, there is an intent uh, by uh, shown by many you know brands and retailers trying to pay a 10% uh, over and above uh, whatever percentage over and above the uh, the price the uh, as a premium is only being focused on uh, i would say on a minimum on a market price generally we see that market prices are very exploitative because uh, you can always manage market prices and farmers have no uh, as long as farmers have no negotiating power uh, if 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 i may come when when uh, either orlando or when uh, you know uh, franco talked about cotton farmer cooperatives in brazil in paraiba in the northern part uh, you know no uh, these are cooperatives and like what uh, what what happens with chetna these are cooperatives where farmers have a say but in uh, most of the organic cotton that's being sold globally uh, are not coming from farmers who are organized so when they are not organized they have no say uh, they, their role ends the moment they supply the cotton so uh, it's imperative that we feel that it's it is difficult to look at Uh, what is a good price you know in uh, in, in, a, in a, you know looking at inflation because uh, let me also cite that in india there is something called a dr swaminathan commission that came up with a a, a solution or or a recommendation that a farmer should be paid 50% over and above the cost of cultivation as a as a minimum minimum support price which is a fair thing having said that that has not been put in place uh by the government because it's difficult one you, you must have also seen all the farmer protests that are happening in india for the last one year near the near the national capital it's all about market support price but would brands be willing to pay that suppose if uh, it is 50% over and above the the cost of cultivation uh would brands be about to accept that as a minimum support price as of now we don't see even brands uh, you know not forget brands uh, traders willing to pay an msp it's still rotating or working around a market price which is more or less 17 to 25% lower than the cotton price even considering a 10% 12% 7% organic premium so uh, i would say what is easy for farmers is to under uh, what is easy for farmers is understanding the price so benchmarking on a support price declared by the government that is like what fair trade advocates so i think i believe in that principle where fair trade says it should be a price declared by you know the market uh, the hi- the highest price so i think at least in a country like india we should go for uh, in my opinion a price declared by the government that should be the that should be benchmarked and not the market price uh, secondly when it comes to the lint pricing i would say this is an anomaly year this could continue for another year or two we don't know but this is not sustainable so uh, 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 you know lint prices in uh, in organic selling at 3 uh, 4 dollars per, per kilogram is never going to be sustainable so how much of it goes to the farmer needs to be looked at so we can't have a, a one size fits all across uh, regions brazil will have its own you know ways of looking at pricing uh, africa could have its own way of looking at pricing and uh, you know same with us but for india i would say uh, our brands at least the brands that have that we have been working uh, even the small medium and also some uh, new brands who have just joined us are keen to accept the print, the policies that we have just worked out uh, on pricing policies and and premiums Right, thank you for that insight, Arun. And I think there's an interesting question there um, that I could probably put to everyone and kind of links to a question that's come up in the Q&A as well about government support and the role 
that um, policy has in um, addressing this issue. And so I'm actually going to go um, back to either Orlando or Francois, if one of you wants to pick this question up. Um, what role do you think that governments have in, in supporting farmers to receive, to ensure that they receive fair prices for their products? Either of you is welcome to answer. Francois, you've uh, unmuted. It's over yes. to you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good question. And it's something that uh, since the beginning, um, we have tried to have the government uh, uh, closer. Um, and I'm talking uh, uh, mostly local government uh, in Brazil. Uh, because to, in my understanding, um, all the, assist, the, the technical uh, assistance um, should be uh, uh, made by the, the government because, I mean, uh, I don't know in other countries, but in Brazil, uh, there is a strong public uh, uh, technical uh, assistance uh, to farmers, but the reality is that they are not, in, most of them are not into organic farmer, farming. Um, and so uh, uh, they are more into like, uh, tr like traditional uh, pesticide uh, model. And uh, it has changed a bit. And um, now we have one of the, the 14 communities is actually uh, uh, a project where uh, there is a public uh, uh, structure involved in the, in the technical assistance, uh, which is uh, great because then we don't need an NGO to, to do that, um, that part. But yes, I mean, people pay taxes uh, um, to their government so that there is uh, uh, assistance to farmers. So uh, I, I don't think it should, I, I don't know if it has something to do with price, but uh, in a way, yes, because you know, it's, it's some work has to be done. Uh, if people want to produce organically, it's just, it's not as easy as it, as it seems. So uh, I think this, this could be a great role for the government, right, to provide uh, technical assistance. Thank you, Francois. And before inviting Orlando in, um, just a, a comment to say that in uh, I work a lot in the EU and um, and there's a real push towards public money for public goods as a concept. So um, to make sure that the right things are subsidized that deliver public goods. And I think that that's something, a concept which seems to be um, gaining some traction. But Orlando, over to you, your thoughts on this. Yes, I completely agree. I think that the support to technical assistance is crucial and it should come from part of the government. It's different in our countries that we don't get much support, talking about Latin America, Africa, Asia, from the government itself. Um, here, for example, there's no support. We've been trying to put organic into the government's agenda for many years. And most of the support to grow and promote organic products in Peru come from NGOs or private companies as, as we are. Um, that will be that on it. I don't know if we have three minutes because when we started talking, I just introduced myself and I didn't have the chance to talk about organic cotton pricing. I have some, a couple of slides that I want to go rapidly to explain a little our view on, on organic cotton pricing, Sarah? Sure, that's no problem. Um, are they the slides that um, we have in the deck already, or are they different slides? Yes, yes, the same. Okay, great. Um, Matilda, would you be able to share them, please? Okay, um, if you just let us know, let Matilda know um, when you yeah, want to the next through. One, and the next one. This is a little, chart that reflects what we see is the factors that affect the organic cotton price in our case in Peru. We have definitely lower yields in the farmers and we have more intensive labor in the field by not using herbicides, pesticides, et cetera. And us as an operating company, we do have additional costs, which are the certification costs, the pricing and funding risk, we secure a price to the farmers without knowing if we will be able to translate that price to the mills or to the brand. We also give funding to all of our farmers and most of them don't have a collateral or a mortgage or anything to back up that funding. So 
the rates of past due accounts is also high. We do pay premiums to the farmers and we do invest in testing of GMO and pesticides in all of our lots. So those costs are also something that make organic cotton prices a lot different from conventional. Next, please. One thing that's not uh, widely known, and in our case, and I, I assume that in many other cases also affects the prices, that the cotton seeds is 62% of the weight in the cotton ball. Uh, when we buy and pay premiums to the farmers for organic cotton, we are buying the seed too. And we're not able to find a market in Peru for organic cotton seed. So that premium that we're paying for the whole uh, ball of cotton, all of the premium is translated only into the fiber. That makes that our costs are even higher than what we would like. We have rotation crops that are some sold as organic and some not. We also secure uh, the purchase of those rotation crops from our farmers. And we have the in conversion period, which is two to three years. And we guarantee that we will buy that cotton as conventional in the past. Now we stand on market for selling that cotton as transition, but not 100% of it. So all those factors and those investments in growing the area of organic cotton are translated into the final price of organic cotton. Next, please. We also implement demonstrative fields in which we try best practices to then translate to other fields. Those fields are owned by our company and we have all the, um, we pay for all the production of cotton there. Most of the times we lose money. That also let us know what the fair price for the cotton is. As we have the structure of the cost in our own field, we know if farmers are making money or losing money every year. Also trainings and technical assistance. Next please. Due to climate change also, we are getting lower yields in our fields as we're not able to use chemicals and that affects the, the price. If there's a lower production, the price needs to be higher to compensate costs. Next please. And all the fixed costs of certifications that I mentioned, the testing, the GMOs, pesticides, qualities, et cetera. And finally, the last one. Uh, well, I talked about this, no? We pay uh, premiums for, for the cotton, for the cotton seed. Uh, we invest a lot in funding. It's a big, big quantity of money that needs to be involved and also risked year for year as we secure the purchases, we advance payment and we are not, if you don't have a long-term contract with your clients and partners and brands, it's very difficult to be able to buy something to see if you are going to be able to sell it and at what price later. So my take is that everything here to secure pr fair prices and that this works is that you need to have a really uh, good partners within your supply chain. You need to have long-term agreements and commitment. And basically you need to find the right partners, companies where sustainability is embedded within the organization and not only seen as a marketing tool and that they really want to go in the same direction as you want to. Well, I, I think I, it took a longer than I thought, so I'll stop there. No, that's great and brilliant summary there, Orlando. Thank you very much. Um, so now I'm gonna to go to some questions that have come in and um, Kim Marie Button, you actually put a question that I had for Max uh, in a much better way than I had it. So uh, Max, could you please address the question, um, which is about the steps that you go through in agreeing and setting the price for organic cotton. And what do you see as the progress with this being uh, going forward? Um, well, uh, there's one point I would like to pick up from what Francois said when you were sitting down with the farmers. And um, that was basically, depending on what price the market is willing to offer, farmers are adjusting um, their production. So 
I mean, in the end, we are all talking about sustainability and how we want to change the face of the world and to 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 a better. And I mean, in the end, fight climate change. That's the ultimate goal. Um, the farmer in Tanzania, the farmer in India, the farmer in South Latin America, um, they they do see this problem as well. They are of course affected by climate change, but their predominant goal is to be able to have food on the table for this year and also for the next year. Um, so obviously um, their planting behavior is very much based on the pricing and um, not only on the pricing, but also on will I be able to get the same price next year? Is it gonna be a sustainable business model for myself? In the end, every farmer is, a, is an entrepreneur. Um, so so we, have, uh, we have been sourcing cotton for supply chains predominantly um, through, through, through a pricing aspect and a form of commitment. Um, so whenever we sit down with farmers, with ginners, with cooperatives, um, we discuss what price is sustainable to them at what price level would they be willing to increase their production? What price level uh, would they decrease the production? Um, and then basically we would address this and um, provide them with pre-financing, provide the gins with pre-financing, give them an offtake agreement. And then based on the supply and based on, sorry, based on the demand, um, we are then basically distributing the cotton from, from origin to the consuming countries. Um, so Francois said, um, organic cotton should not be a commodity. I fully agree. And um, the supply and many supply chains, in fact, are already doing that, going um, to origins and sourcing cotton um, from the farmer directly. And this definitely is a good business model. But what needs to be understood is the, the majority of the textile world is still sourcing, very decentralized, um, going to the, I'm going to call it the cheapest um, um, uh, um, uh, ready-made garment producer, who then in turn is going to the cheapest uh, um, knitter, and then to the cheapest spinner, to the cheapest origin. And um, that way, basically, we're all very, very price sensitive, um, which in the end makes it necessary for cotton and for organic cotton, unfortunately, to be seen as a commodity. Um, so we do have to, and if if we want to have a grip on the price, it needs to be it needs to be um, basically addressed from the supply side and only from the supply side. And this is where long term commitment really is needed. And um, this is what we've been doing for the last couple of years. And um, so far, been able to see a very, very good increase um, in production from origin uh, whenever we've been willing to give commitments. Great, thank you very much, Max. And there's some um, clear themes that are emerging here. So we haven't got very long left. Um, so I think we, I'm gonna pick up on some of the questions that were sent through ahead of the webinar. Um, so a quick question for all of you, um, and feel free to jump in, whoever wants to go first. What is your primary advice on actions that brands should um, do to include organic in their sourcing strategies? What advice would you give to a brand who is thinking about including organic in their sourcing strategies? Who would like to go first? Oh, Francois, oh. then Orlando. Oh no, Orlando, then Francois. <laughs> Okay, uh, well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, as a brand, you need to do your due diligence. And I know Francois knows this a lot better than I do, and he'll talk about that. You need to know uh, who are you dealing with, where your farmers are, where your money and contribution is going in terms of changing the lives of the farmers, and not only, as we've talked, uh, get it through a third party, because they have a certificate and not knowing your traceability of the whole supply chain. Uh, papers are every time could be fake, could be counterfeit, could be anything. The more for me, and I, I'm sure that for Francois and many other brands that have done things good, it's uh, more importantly, to know who are you dealing with and where are you sourcing from more than documents. Great, thank you very much, Orlando. Francois. So my first answer would be, if you want to go organic, call Orlando. <laughs> 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 
But the second one um, would be to buy a plane ticket and to, so it's basically the same answer, but it's to, to, to check it on the field and to realize what it is, because uh, then it may, it's, it, it's a very different story once you've seen what uh, organic agriculture and, uh, is about. And, and it's not only about numbers of pe or pesticides, is to be able to see the joy in the families and, uh, and um, the real life of the people uh, that change when they, when they turn into organic agriculture. And when they tell you the story, um, you know, face to face, then there is no way you can just turn back and, 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 and buy conventional uh, again. So I think it's, it's really uh, also about experiencing uh, the thing is, is something that that Orlando and and uh, does with his company. He invites his clients, and uh, we took part of one of these trips to um, to visit the farmers. And and and, and this is this is key. Uh, uh, and I think uh, uh, you know, Maximilian, if if you do these trips, you should invite your clients. I think um, they would. Uh, you know, I think we 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 need more of these uh, uh, real experiences to understand how things are made and and um, how all these supply chains get totally crazy because people don't really care anymore about the things, but um, it's just go there. Great, thank you very much for that. So um, over to Max, would you agree with that? Hi. Here we go. Um, well, of course, I definitely agree. And and, and transfer and taking clients along definitely is is one of the things uh, we're doing. And in fact, uh, building these long long lasting supply chains is is the main objective. Um, fully agree. Um, but we do have to face the other side of the medal. Um, for 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 large and high volume brands, it's not always possible to source from one specific region all the time. Um, of course, it works in their in their sustainability por portfolio very well. Um, but if we are really considering consuming the bulk of their resources from an organic point of view, um, we we need to we need to have a more streamlined approach. And um, I think I think this is only possible if you're collaborating with partners um, who are able to provide these quantities. And as Orlando said, I um, fully agree on knowing your, your, your business partners and doing your due diligence. Um, at the moment, there are fantastic approaches uh, when it comes to traceability and not solely relying on the, on the transaction certificate. And I think um, we're moving so quickly in all um, technological developments. Why not explore these kind of traceability projects along with committing to sourcing organic carbon. Great, thank you very much, Maximilian. And Arun, we'd love to hear from you on this as well. Uh, uh, I, I do agree with, uh, you know, uh, Orlando when he talked about traceability, going to the last mile farmers, you know, uh, brands going to the farms, flying down to the farms as also, you know, uh, Francois also suggested, uh, Having said that, uh, I might sound a bit controversial here, but uh, uh, honestly speaking, uh, you know, uh, for me, it's important that we don't romanticize uh, poverty. We don't romanticize organic cotton per se, because I think what is important here is not scale, but scope. Because farmers, as uh, you know, as I think uh, all the panelists, whether it was Max or you know uh, Francois or Lando pointed out, will make decisions. Uh, they, are, they are the biggest risk taker entrepreneurs uh, than any one of us. Because uh, if if my software company does not work, I'll go into automobile, you know, setting up an automobile factory. But farmers have no choice, so they are the biggest risk takers. And today with COVID, I will tell you in India, I think the biggest demand is for food. I think. The governments, uh, especially uh, the, the developing countries, especially like India, would not uh, invest, would not try to promote a particular crop. They would look at promoting agriculture, whether it's organic, regenerative, or you know, zero budget. Uh, but th that, that should be factored in when brands take a call because it cannot be just a cotton. Uh, you know, it's not organic cotton. It's organic cotton systems that we should talk about. Brands should... That whole paradigm shift needs to be made where brands talk about organic cotton system, soils, uh, scope, agriculture. So that is one. 
to uh, i mean uh, since covid for a year and a half we were we thought that we were a bit uh, relaxed because we didn't have visitors but now suddenly after things have settled down we are seeing visitors sometimes too many visitors also are a big issue to handle because it really affects field work so yes good to have visitors but there should be a planned uh, you know brands also have to plan their visits and it's not just about taking photographs and videos and and uh, you know romanticizing but also you know investing in the, in the in the farming systems is what my take is mm -hmm. great thank you erin i think that's a um, important point well made farmers are um, have an equal and um, important role as a part of the value chain and shouldn't be seen as um, separate or different or well you put it a lot better than me so I won't labor the point okay so we're just about out of time and um, today's obviously been quite a short session it was always intended to just be the beginning of the conversation and we'll use your questions and comments and the discussion um, that's happened today as um, as further information to uh, make more of the pre-read so we'll um, we'll bulk that out add some more to it. And also we can continue this conversation over on the um, Textile Exchange Organic Cotton Roundtable Hub. And I'll ask one of the team to put a link to that in the chat. Um, so if you didn't, your question wasn't answered today and a lot of them weren't, I'm sorry about that. Um, please feel free to post it there. Um, and uh, I think that's just about it, apart from to uh, put a question back to you as our audience. So, um, the Mentimeter question, so you go to menti.com and put in the code 999888377, is what actions will you take after today's discussion? So a very open question there. Is um, anything that's been said that inspired you, that made you think about things in a different way, um, that will translate, or that could translate through into doing something differently in your situation whatever that may be so the mentimeter is also linked in the chat so you can just link through from there and also the ocrt link is on there too so yeah learn more about sourcing from farmers great that was um that was a strong theme that certainly came out this makes my job a lot easier because you're basically summarizing the key points from today so i'm, I'm sorry if that comes across as lazy it's not meant to this is great, yeah, buy-in conversion cotton and organic. And we didn't talk a lot about in conversion today, but the, you can find resources about in conversion cotton on the um, Textile Exchange website as well. Um, I'll ask one of the team to put a link to that in the chat. I'm not sure if you, you've got that prepared, but um, if you could team, sorry. Okay, fair prices, great. Invest, invest in in conversion cotton and um, just the final thing I should say is that we are just coming into our um, 2021 OCRT Global and Regional Summits, and there's a link in the chat to that as well. Um, we'd love to see you there. We'll be carrying on discussions like these, especially about in conversion during those sessions. And so with one minute remaining, I'd just like to say a big thank you to our panelists and to all of you for coming. Uh, you're what makes the Organic Cotton Roundtable community. Um, so keep doing what you're doing, keep telling us about it and reach out to the community for information and support when you need it. But thank you very much to all of you, especially our panelists. It's been great to have you today. And I'm gonna hand over to Rose to wrap up. Thank you to our speakers, as Sarah said, and thank you for participating in today's webinar. As a friendly reminder, recording will be posted on the Hub. And again, please join the OCRT community in the Hub to continue this conversation. That concludes our webinar. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone.